All right, all right. Thank you, everybody, for coming to our weekly napkin underwriting Zoom. Glad to have you guys on. Um, as always, we try to keep this uh, these within an hour, so we will be shooting to end this right at nine o'clock tonight. So thank you for making time out of your busy schedules to hang out with us and talk about napkin underwriting. With that said, we'll go ahead and kick it off. So. Uh, Ed, why don't you get us going, man? What's going on, everybody? Hope you guys are excited for another Tuesday night here with the gang. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for being here every week and making this very, very fun for us um, and giving us a crowd to talk to because it'd be really weird if it was just us three talking to each other about stuff we already know. But We could still probably that, talk no. about that for hours. Yeah, that's also true. Yeah, it, it, our meetings always go long, I should say, to say the least. Um, but yeah, again, thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to run through the schedule like we always do, what we got planned for today. Obviously, if you have questions, let us know. And if you have a deal for us to underwrite for you, also please let us know. Um, and if anyone doesn't have the napkin underwriting calculator, we'll send that out um, shortly. But yeah. Let's see what we got going on for today, and uh, we'll take it from there. Awesome. Well, hey, welcome, everyone. Glad to have you here this evening. Um, so going to quickly go over the agenda. So, uh, to, of course, uh, Ed always, always kicks it off for us. Ed, thanks for doing the intro. Uh, and then we're going to go into our community ecosystem and talk about all the amazing uh resources that that the multifamily freedom chasers community can provide you so we'll be going we'll be covering that here very shortly and then uh last week if you joined us um ed and i talked a little bit about exit underwriting and we're going to finish that that discussion off tonight talk about exit cap rates noi and so forth so we're looking forward to having aldo uh kind of help lead that this evening and then then it's time to get out your napkin and um so those of you who have joined us previously, uh, we, uh, Ed, Aldo, and I have built a, a napkin underwriting tool that we would love to share with you. And so this week, if you if you don't have the napkin underwriting tool and you'd like it, let us know. Um, and what we'd like for you to do, Ed will share his email in the chat, and then we will email that over to you. I think that it, that will just make it the easiest. Uh, we always throw the link in the chat as well, but. Uh, I think we'd like for you to go ahead and just, if you can email Ed, that'd be great. And then we'll make sure you get the napkin. And then uh, finally, uh, we'll do a quick question question and answer. So, so with that, uh, we'll introduce a little bit who we are. So Ed, uh, introduce, uh, feel free to introduce yourself, sir. Oh I'm man, California. is he still with us? Ed was having some technical difficulties here in the pregame, so he may not be with us. Are you back? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you now, man. Okay, cool. So like I was saying, um, I am based out of Los Angeles, California. Um, been a realtor for five years now, uh, have property management experience, um, and I focus now on doing a lot of acquisitions, underwriting, and operations on the multifamily side. Um, I hope you guys caught all that, um, but yeah, I'll, caught, I'll try to keep it brief. Awesome. Yeah, man, we got that. Good deal. Well, uh, and I'll introduce Aldo and I uh, really quick. So um, my name is Will Otis, and um, I am co-founder of Stoke Holding Solutions with my ride or die partner for past, wow, going on, shoot. 15 years plus almost somewhere in there uh Aldo and Chetta so we're super excited we're based out of Chattanooga Tennessee uh we um are multifamily investors um that primarily focus on the southeast of the United States and uh man we're just super excited to be here and uh Aldo and Chetta is a underwriting ninja and so uh we're we're just uh super excited to have him part of this and and of course Ed uh, we, we can't leave that guy out too. Um, he is a machine out on the West Coast. So we're just excited to be here with you all this evening and uh, look forward to sharing this evening with you guys. So with that, we want to get to know a little bit about you 
And so if anyone wants to throw up, uh, feel free to raise your hand and uh, we'd love to get to know you. And if no one um, raises their hand here shortly, I will pick someone out. All right, Mr. Jerry Miles, uh, we'll go go for it, Jerry. All right, how you guys doing? Good, man. Welcome, brother. Good. Man. Yeah, good, good to be here with you guys. I like yeah, seeing your I'm, dog uh, in the background. Uh, yeah, that's Marley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'm Jerry Miles. I'm a um, commercial mortgage broker. Uh, we we do a lot of uh, multifamily uh, debt. Um, anything commercial real estate related, uh, but uh, glad to be a part of this group and this uh, network of people. Um, we do a, um, a debt call every other Wednesday. It won't be this Wednesday, but we'll be doing one next Wednesday. And uh, this Wednesday, we'll be putting out a video on the current debt market. They're going to be sending out a bunch of numbers on um, inflation and things tomorrow. So we'll be putting a putting a video out about that and what it means for the um, the debt market uh, here tomorrow and we'll post it on the uh, Freedom Chasers uh, Facebook page so keep an eye out for that. Awesome man well definitely looking forward to that and for those of you who don't know Jerry Miles he is our one and only MFC debt broker and so uh, you definitely need to join every other Wednesday evening for our debt zoom. Jerry appreciate you being here brother. Always hey, good yeah, to see you, you man. Yeah thanks for joining. And, uh, and Jerry may just be able to add to our conversation this evening as well on exit cap rates. He was super influential on our last discussion. So looking forward to that. Uh, and I see we have another hand raised. So uh, Adrian, is that, I, I believe that's how you say your name. How do, how do you say your name? I'm sorry. No, you are correct. Congratulations. Right. You're one of the few. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about who you are. Welcome. Hi everyone. My name is Adrian DC. I am in Boston, Massachusetts. I have been a property manager for 13 years. I've been a real estate agent in Mass for about six years. I'm also a notary here in Massachusetts. I am looking to build my rental portfolio. I have a goal, a long-term goal for myself of building up to 10,000 doors by 2023. Let's go, let's go. So that is my goal and uh, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so it, any man. kind of help, instruction, I'm, I'm an open book and ready to absorb as much as I possibly can. That's awesome. If you haven't already, let's throw some fires in the chat for Adrian. That is freaking awesome. 10,000 units, that is a huge goal. And uh, I know you're gonna achieve it. So keep it up and welcome. We're glad to have you here, so. Appreciate it. All right, so with that, um, although you wanna talk a little bit about our ecosystem? Absolutely, man, let's do it. Uh, let's get hyped up here. So we have uh, this nice little ecosystem here in place that the multifamily freedom chaser core team put together. And uh, for the sake of all of our community, really, and this is how it, it plays out. Uh, on Sunday nights at 8.30 p.m., we start off with an activation Zoom where we have celebrity guests that come on and they talk to us and they activate us for the rest of the week. We've had all kinds of people come to this uh, Zoom uh, from uh, Robert Martinez to people from uh, Grant Cardone's team, for, from uh, uh, Rod Khalif, people, uh, Vina Jetty, people that have um, had you know millions, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in assets under management. Michael Blanc, that's right, how can I forget? Um, on here to activate us into not only the right mindset, but get us going for the week. And what better way then to start off the week in multifamily than talking to brokers? <clears throat> if you're getting into multifamily, you need a deal. You need apartments to look at to buy. So you go on our broker, talk, broker talks with Pete and Ed and they have been doing a, a fabulous job. I've only been able to join once since Ed was on there, but uh, they get on there, they call brokers, they coach you, they walk you through it. They talk about all the nuances that come along with talking to brokers because it, uh, it is a little bit of a different language you have to speak. So uh, go on there and learn and take action and try to find some deals. On Tuesday nights, you get to hang out with us because once you have a deal to look at, 
you have to know if it's a if it's a good deal. If it's a what do we call it? If it's a dud or a stud. So uh, you come on here. We'll put it on the calculator and we'll see if it's uh, something you need to pursue uh, after that. <clears throat> and then on alternating Wednesdays, we have uh, you know our own uh, Jerry Miles and Shelly Miles talk about the current state of the market, uh, the debt market, and talk about different. Um, debt and finance vehicles you can use to be able to purchase a property. Um, and then, of course, uh, every other Wednesday, we have uh, Victor. We have Victor N to the G, our very own ninja from the MFC Core Group. And he talks about getting deeper and diving deeper into the underwriting uh, to really, really understand if, it, if the deal is good, what offers to make. Uh, understanding the market, just getting really deep into the underwriting process. So with that, our hope is that you get not only activated, but also have the chance and the ability to take action, imperfect action, because the key here is to take imperfect action consistently so that you can grow and be able to uh, hit your goals, your 10,000 unit goals, right? So um, that's what we're here for. And we're so glad that you guys are joining us in this journey. So, and the kicker, that's right. It is all free. It is absolutely all free. So uh, thanks for joining us. And with that, we'll get into our contact info here. So, so I, actually, I'm, I'm on my phone, so you guys should be able to hear me. This is Edward. <laughs> um, so yeah, our contact info is on here. Um, please utilize it. Like, um, I know he's not on the call. I don't think so today, but for example, we're talking with David today, uh, who's also a member of the community. He had a question and wanted to uh, more insight on uh, the different things we bring to the table in regard to underwriting. And we're just here to be a resource, use us, whether it's emailing us a question or a deal to look at, or if it's um, trying to structure something creative. I'm sure all of will try to hear me talk about it, but there isn't much on the um, creative side and the wacky, strategic, weird deals that I like to offer on um, that I can't help with. So like use this as a resource uh, if you have any questions. And uh, we, we all like to connect in that sense and why we encourage everyone to share their superpower so that we can make sure that we have a strong community and um, you guys can work together and we can help you out as much as possible. So use our email, reach out to us. Our phone numbers are in our names. Um, and let us know how we can help you. That's right. Okay. Now, for our feature topic tonight, we're going to finish off the second part of the underwriting tool. And Ed got you all started last week talking about the exit portion of the underwriting tool, what that involved, where to get that information. Um, and the different nuances that come along with that. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to our calculator so that we can uh, kind of go over that line by line. It's important to know and understand each one of these inputs and the formulas that are involved in each one of these inputs so you know what you're getting and why, right? And so um, you guys talked about average rents, where to get those, the importance of relationships around being able to get those, um, you know, the occupancy assumptions at the end. Uh, the total income, the expense ratios, and why we use that, um, that sort of rule of, rule of thumb for that. <clears throat> and then um, all that's left to talk about is a, the, the bottom half, essentially. And so once you have all of these in place here, so, you know, let's go to 200 or something. Once you have all of these in place, then... <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just I'm putting in some placeholders here <clears throat> so you can see it at work, right? So once you have your average rents, you have your occupancy, and you have your expense ratio, now you have the ability to have revenue minus operating expenses, keyword operating expenses. And then what you get after that is your NOI or your net operating income. Your net operating income is a function of your operations in the in the asset, right? So um, any any expenses that have to do with operating the assets, 
go here or get counted here. Things that don't get counted in your in the PL uh, that contribute to the net operating income are things like uh, your mortgage expenses, uh, any kind of depreciation that you're taking out on uh, on on the assets, uh, asset management fees. Some well, that's sometimes debated, but I put it below the line. Asset management fees, um, capital expenditure reserves, those kind of things go below the line, and they don't count to your NOI. It's very important. It's very important, and one day we'll we'll get into that. Um, but so then you get your net operating income. Now, the cool thing about multifamily is that the properties are valued based on the performance of the property. And the performance of the property is this net operating income because anything outside of the net operating income is not, is not really something that you can control, right? You can't control the mortgage. You can't control you know, some of these other things that, that are on there. So um, the, the value of the property is based on how well you operate the properties, <clears throat> right? And so that, that is, um, I guess, undergirded, or that is reflected in the net operating income, okay? So in order for us to do that, to get, you know, the value, okay, so once, once we have the NOI, then there are a couple of different metrics below that that we look at to see how well uh, we're looking into the future, how well this is going to do based on two things. One, how much we can drive the rents or how much we can increase the revenue. And two, how well we can control or even um, diminish our expenses, right? With bringing in efficiencies, et cetera. And so, oh man, look at this, a 3,200% <clears throat> cap rate. <laughs> How about that? This is more of a, let's call it a 15 million. Okay. Um, so with that, once we have our NOI, then we're able to see the next part here, and we'll start going into this year now, the cap rate based on the purchase price. So this is a way for you to compare which way your returns have gone based on the initial price. And the cap rate is just that. The cap rate specifically and, and technically means capitalization rate, right? And it is basically the return that you would get for an asset if you paid for it all cash, it is an unlevered return from your purchase price, right? So in this example, let's say we paid $10 million for this asset, our going in cap rate being 5.4, meaning that if you paid if you paid $10 million and your NOI is $540,000, your unlevered returns here would be 5.4%. That's the essence or the technical term cap rate, right? There's different ways that you can look at it because you can divide into the cap rate or you can multiply it into the cap rate. And so there's different ways that you can look into that. And so this specific cap rate that we're calculating here is cap rate based on the purchase price, right? So the constant here is the purchase price. What changes then is going to be the cap rate. And the variable that is driving the change in cap rate is your NOI. So your purchase price remains the same. The X is your cap rate here in this one specifically. And so then your variable, the one that changes is gonna be your NOI. So because this stays here and the NOI can go either up or down, right? Then that affects the cap rate. If your cap rate starts here down low and it ends up high based on your purchase price, you've done a good job. It means you've increased the value of your asset, okay? So that's, that's that. Um, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure you guys will have a few questions on that, so hold them for the end there, but uh, 
that's how you compare the cap rate in the beginning based on your purchase price and then at the end based on your purchase price okay now we're going to get out of this mentality and go into another way to look at uh, the value we're going to go and look at the valuation portion of your um, asset that was only a comparative number that you can use based on purchase price so now you're getting you're looking at, at the future and you're saying in five years how much can i get for this how much money can i get for my asset because the two things that you're wanting from a deal when you get it well there's more but the two main things you want from a deal when you get it is cash flow you want that money coming in every single month and make sure that your investors are getting paid that cash flow. And number two, upside, right? You want to make sure that when you sell your property, you sell it for more than you bought it for. Okay. That's goal number one. And that's why it's so important. So important when you're looking at assumable loans or anything, when you're purchasing a property, to look at the cap rate and make sure that in the future, you're able to sell it at the same cap rate or at least underwrite well enough or project well enough to where even if your cap rate expands or goes up, that, you're out, that your upside is able to make up the difference so that you still have a, a good chunk between your initial purchase price and your sales price, if that makes sense, okay? So how in the world do I get the value or the valuation of uh, a property five years down the road? Well, that's what's called the exit cap rate. Okay, so the exit cap rate. So now I have four minutes and I think I got it. So uh, the exit cap rate is not a formula that you get from anyone. Oh, I mean, it's, sorry, it's not a formula that you get from a, from a spreadsheet like this. It is essentially a guess from professionals in the field about where they think the cap rates are going to be in the next five years, seven years, et cetera. When you underwrite a deal with a with an agent or with a with a debt broker, they're going to underwrite an exit cap rate. You might want to pay attention to that. When you talk to a broker, you're gonna, you can ask them not only what the current cap rates are in that market, but also what the foreseeable future tells us the cap rates are potentially going to be. CoStar also has uh, some crystal ball um, exit cap rates in their reports as well. And so make sure that you have a good contact that can get you maybe a CoStar report that'll tell you that for that market, okay? So this is something that you're given. You can mess with it and you can get more conservative, you know, or, you know, get more risky with it. But this, this is given to you. So that's how you get your valuation. You, you get what everyone is saying the exit cap rate is or what everyone is guessing the exit cap rate is. And then you use your NOI, your cap rate to be able to come up with a valuation. So the valuation of any property is the reverse of getting the cap rate. Okay. so. It is basically your NOI divided by your cap rate. Okay, your NOI divided by your cap rate is the value of your property. And so, yes, there is a component of market conditions into the valuation of your property, but it, there is also a condition of how well you operate your property in there. So with that said, once you plug all those numbers in and you have an exit cap rate, it's going to give you a sell price, that a ballpark sell price that you're going to be able to sell this asset for in the future. And if everything is good and well, this number should be a positive number and it should be above a certain threshold, depending on what your goals are as an investor. For example, us, we really like to see a million dollars or more in upside for it to be a worthwhile investment. Um, so that's up to you to decide that. Okay. Should we go into the underwriting or should we take some questions? What do you think? I want to jump in real quick too. Uh, yeah, if you guys hear me. yeah, I just want to add real quick. And guys, I'm going to keep saying this week in, week out. It's really important to know your market. 
Because that's where these numbers are coming in from. Like, if you just rely on an agent that you've talked to a few times, especially if they're the agent that's representing you, they want to get the deal done. Um, they want to, and look, I, I hate to say this, once you get into a contract and a deal closes, it's no one else's problem but yours. Like, it's just a sad truth. Like, no one, you can't go back and tell the seller, oh, I didn't know X, Y, Z. You can't go back to the agent tell, say, oh, you told me it's going to be 5%, but it ended up being 4 You can't say anything. Like, it, it, it's closed. It's only your name. It's your problem now. Um, and I just want to make that clear is make sure you do your due diligence. More importantly, if you're starting out, though, is ask questions because these are questions that anyone you bring a deal to, whether it's us, whether it's Will Aldo or myself, or I don't care if it's Grant Cardone or if it's Robert Martinez or uh, Michael Blank, they're all going to ask the same questions that you need to vet yourself. If you want to learn and like you're on these Zooms and you're, you're participating, you want to make sure that you're, like, you're taking a proactive action. Like what information would I ask if I was looking to purchase this myself? And if you have all those questions answered, cool. Send it to someone to go further into detail. And you learn more as the, you, you share with more people and those you learn those tricks and stuff. So just keep that in mind as well. Uh, it seems like there are two questions here. What are the most common ways that brokers cook the numbers to make it look better on the OM? Can you trust anything in the OM? Um, I don't want to say no. Like you do want to trust it because at the end they it's their opinion and they will always have a disclaimer saying um, buyer to verify. That's your get out of jail free card as a broker. It just is the reality of it. But when you are looking at anything on the OM, I sometimes use it to my advantage. Like you gave me these numbers. Based on the numbers you gave me, this is what I can offer. If anything post opening escrow is different from the numbers you suggested and I find new information, I'm just going to reduce the price. And if you complain or you say, no, or this is the final price or the seller starts pushing back, you just pull out of escrow. Simple as that. Like if I find out the roof has an issue, if I find out um, one of the units is not able to be, it just needs more rehab. It's not habitable. Okay, I have new information now. That's the point of the due diligence period in um, during escrow, which um, actually all the will, we were talking about this. We feel like the escrow process is one of the least talked about times in a deal for multifamily. Like, and it's such a stressful and so many components and so many moving parts. So we may have a Zoom dedicated just to discussing that. We'll get more information on that and give it to you guys, obviously, as we discuss more about it. But um, we will go over the escrow process and how to verify all the numbers and due diligence that we discuss on here. Because at the end of the day, remember, the underwriting is kind of the easy part. The hard part is getting it on the contract, closing the contract, like or closing the escrow, and then executing on the value add. Um, Long-winded answer, but that's a topic that's very important we'll get into. Um, and then there's one more question here. Uh, what the difference between the going game cap rate and cap rate based on purchase price? Aldo, you want to explain that one real quick? Yeah, sure. So that's a really good question. And so they're both related, right? They're, they're very much related. And they're both based on the sell or purchase price, or the purchase price. Okay. So the going in cap rate basically tells you if I buy it for this much, what is my return or NOI, my return on this investment, uh, the percentage of return on, the, on this investment, if I were to put it all in cash, right? If it was unlevered. So in this case, we paid 10 million bucks for this deal. The NOI that we were able to, that we calculated was $540,000 per year. The return on this investment is 5.4%. That's what's going, that's what the going in cap rate is, right? Um, that is not the same thing as a market cap rate. It is not the same thing as a market cap rate. And what it tells you is what the return is at this purchase price. That helps you also to know if you're um, negatively leveraged, um, et cetera. And so that, then you take that and as your 
as your operations get better, as you increase revenue, as you decrease or keep your expenses low or you know where you need them to be, your NOI should grow. Your NOI should grow. When your NOI grows at the end of this period or your whole term, it should be higher than when you started. Okay. And so at this point, you just do a comparative analysis, just a really quick division. Again, you divide that by your purchase price to get another cap rate. So it's basically a point in time cap rate. My cap rate when I started and my cap rate now, right? Or my, my return, let's call it my return, my capitalization rate, my return now based on my purchase price and my return then based on uh, my purchase price. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yes, I'm following. Thank you. Awesome. All right, Natasha, you had another one here. That's exactly right, Jason. Um, Natasha says, do you want to just ask us, Natasha? Yeah, um, if you're, so you have under, in the underwriting part, the valuation and the rehab costs how does that get figured into the exit because you're talking about having it below the line you talked about having uh, what uh, the mortgage the depreciation all that capex all that stuff below the line right how does right. that get figured into the final because shouldn't it go up at least what you put into it plus plus i mean yeah, that's a really that's actually a really good question so in this case returns does not mean cash flow right so your cash flow so your returns in this case is your net operating income for the for the purposes of cap rate only right <clears throat> so uh what the rehab costs are giving you is just an idea of how much you know you could potentially use to you know upgrade these um you know, these, these apartments so that you can get the upside. This can be changed depending on, you know, the condition of the building, et cetera. And so that's, that's going to change, uh, you know, these two numbers. However, these are not taken into consideration on any of these other calculations, right? And so this, this is just going to be part of the, you know, part of the raise or, or whatever, you know, if, if you're able to get it for less than that, um, it doesn't, it doesn't factor into, into that. Now that's, so this is when, when you're using this calculator, it isn't, it isn't the end all calculator. This is a ballpark, like, oh man, at this price right now, does this look like it could be a good deal? Because then when you start plugging it into an actual analyzer, then you'll say, oh man, like I'm going to have to invest a little bit too much. I'm going to have to raise a little bit too much for these returns, you know, from a revenue standpoint. And I may not be able to get the returns that I need to get for that. Now, in the future, we might, you know, continue to evolve this napkin to have a little bit of that component. Um, but as it is right now, it's just a snapshot into, hey, does this deal make sense? And should we, should we pursue it any further and go deeper into it? So before I waste any time trying to analyze it, I want to know, you know, where, where these people are at. And I want to ask you real quick. I'm going to jump in for a sec. So, yeah, I just want to jump in real quick. Remember, the cap rate has nothing to do with external factors. The cap rate is solely focused on the building's performance. How you get there, what your debt is like, is not really involved. Because rehab and CapEx, albeit you will see as an expense, Sorry, rehab and CapEx is not going to be a oncurring expense in your T12. What it is going to be, is that's like repairs and maintenance stuff. So repairs and maintenance will be factored in your T12. But rehab and like CapEx, I normally wouldn't want to include it on my T12 in my general ledger because that's something that once I do one time, it's like, all right, we're good to go. Like that's just a value add play. You want that below the line so that you know it's... Um, that you know why that money was spent because it can make your T12 look disgusting. Obviously, like you, you spent 30,000 on a unit. You're like, oh, if you do that on three units, your year looks terrible. But in reality, you're adding value. You're increasing rent. It's a lot more um, beneficial than 
run for the hills like this deal's terrible because that's not the case obviously now for the repair maintenance thing that's a different story roof ac xyz like these are all things you have to fix and um they occur occasionally so you want that in the t12 but the cap rate in for the most part rehab isn't going to heavily affect that thanks all right Great. Do we, want, do we want to see if anyone has a deal that they want to analyze? Yeah. If not, and I know Aldo has one pulled up that we can look at, but does anyone have a deal that they want to throw in the napkin this evening? If so, feel free to raise your hand or uh, you can on mute. in the chat. All right. All right. I guess we'll uh, take a look at an old deal. That's right. Good old. Uh, this was actually our first LOI ever uh, that we put <laughs> in on the not on a property. And uh, yeah, so uh, this was a deal in Nashville outside, just outside of Nashville. So we need units, a really good area. Actually, it was a very good area. It was a portfolio of 34 duplexes so 78 units all the same i think they were all two ones i believe um and uh, i forget what the average rates were i was going to be looking at that so the renovation assumptions get it up to 1500 but i believe here we go current um current rents were at 1200 bucks or something like that current 1150 Let's call it 1150. I believe it was 90, 95% occupied. Um, <clears throat> do you recall that, Will? Yeah, I think it was 95%. I'm trying to remember exactly, but that sounds about right. No, let's do 95% because they had some turnover there. <clears throat> it was a C, C plus class and probably needed some light to moderate on a few, on a few of the units, right? A lot of them had already been, or some of them had been, there was some meat on the bones for that. So <clears throat> their, uh, their guidance price was $12 million, right? So that was like, is that right? 153000 dollars a unit or something like that so you know that had us coming in at a pretty <clears throat> um how would you say unattractive cap rate i guess at the time and so but it did have an assumable loan on it <clears throat> i think it had a 3.25 um 55 percent ltv so it was going to be a big raise and uh at the time we probably could have gotten a loan for like five maybe maybe just under five so we could have been close uh to that at a more decent ltv but anyway um then we know we go into calculating the upside so the upside here was 14.99 for for the per unit at 95 percent occupancy you see here the differences in NOI. So we, we jumped a good bit. <clears throat> we went up a point and point and a quarter or 100 point, 125 points in uh, cap rate. And so the sale price, <clears throat> however, uh, would have probably been less, right? So we probably would have sold it at less than we bought it for if we bought it for this much. Um, now this is Nashville and Nashville's, uh, Nashville can be a little crazy. So this, this could very well have been a, you know, a six cap, um, even on a C property, but anyway, <clears throat> we decided to throw in $9 million offer. And, um, uh, even with the cap rate expansion, you know, we would have had a pretty decent return, but uh, they didn't like that. So 
when you get it. How can I understand how much more I can offer if there's a good assumable loan? Okay, this is where schools of thought battle it out. Am I right, Ed? <laughs> and so uh, it just, man, honestly, it just, it really depends. It really, really depends. An assumable loan can be a good tool and you'll hear people say, as long as you don't overpay for it. Some people like Ed don't care if you overpay for it as long as you have good terms, which makes sense. The only caveat that I would throw in there is watch your sales price. Because uh, you may have, if you're comfortable with getting a net zero upside and just going in for the cash flow, then that's fine. And you know, if you're hoping that in 10 years, the cycle goes so low so that it goes below your initial going in cap rate then great right so um Wes is that does that kind of make sense real quick to add to that the bottom line with the assumable loans it's it's way too many components for me to give one rule of thumb that fits everything it, there's right. just too right. many factors type of loan length of the loan rate of the loan is it interest only when does it convert to principal and interest how much is it leveraged? How, how are you getting the difference on the leverage and the purchase price? Are you doing seller carry in addition to that? It, it, there's way too many factors. And that's why you, I always say if there's ever an assumable loan to have like a standard rule of thumb, which I don't know what yours would be um, when you are doing a napkin underwriting to be like, okay, now I should do a little bit of a bigger deep dive. And also, Ask questions to the broker. Like, if there's a very attractive assumable loan, the reason they might be selling is because something that has to do with that loan. To be to be straight, like honest about it, there's a deal I'm working on. The assumable loan or the assumable loan, yeah, goes from fixed to variable in four months. Once that deal goes very, the loan goes variable. It's not as attractive. It's really like it could get ugly real quick. And if you don't know that or if you overlook that or if you don't factor that in, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So keep that in mind. Like there's a, a reason why someone's trying to sell a loan for uh, that's a very strong loan. Just dig a little deeper. It takes a lot more due diligence. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So and I'll, go ahead, man. Yeah, sorry, Aldo. Just to kind of add to that a little bit too. I think, you know, oftentimes when I look at an assumable, uh, you know, an assumable loan, I look at, you know, Think about the strategy for the asset. What's your hold period on this on this asset? So, is it a five year hold? Is it a ten year hold? Um, and let's say, for instance, the assumable loan has ten years left or seven years left, with you know three or four years of interest only period left, you know, on this loan, and you're planning on holding this asset for, you know, four years or five years, whatever it might be, you know it may, that might make sense, you know, for you to be able to offer a little bit more for the asset because of the hold period and what the interest only, you know, is left on the loan and so forth. But again, I think the most important thing, and, and again, I'm going to talk for Aldo and myself, we've not, we've not, we, we kind of shy away a little bit from, um, I, well, I don't want to say we want to shy away from it, but I think we just go into it a little bit more cautiously because, again, uh, we we personally don't want to get into a position where we're overpaying for an asset, and then when we go to refinance, you know, on this loan, we're hoping we all pray that you know interest rates go back down, uh, you know, back to the threes or whatever it might be, but uh, there, there's no way to really forecast that, and so I think a good rule of thumb is does the does the deal make sense? Are you not going to get, you know, messed over on the back end? And, um, and, you know, and, and if, if you need support or, you know, assistance with that, reach out to Ed, Aldo, myself, whoever, you know, we'll be happy to talk through a specific deal with you as well. And I think, you know, we, you know, we can try and help support you guys with that and, um, you know, kind of give you our thoughts on it, but hopefully that answers your question, Wes. <clears throat> Good great. question. Yeah, great question. Um, let's see, where was I here? Um, 
Okay. Yeah. I think I think that was pretty much it <clears throat> on that. Does anyone have questions on the tool itself? Or has maybe maybe drop a one in the chat if you've used it at least once. I use it every day. What rates are you using? Nice. Nice, Sandy. How do you get it? Email Ed or email is going to drop it in the chat. I mean, Ed, Ed's going to drop it in the chat too. What rates, Mario's asking, what rates are you using for the napkin? <clears throat> so great question. In this case, there was a, uh, in this case, there was an assumable loan. So I put that rate in there. Uh, but typically, I go to really good friends like Jerry Miles, and I ask him, or I go to the to the debt Zoom, and I uh, get the uh, latest on uh, what the current state of the debt market is. Additionally, you learn if, in these uh, debt Zooms that agency debt is based on the treasury yield, <clears throat> uh, plus between 1.5 and 2.5%. Uh, on the spread. So that's kind of the spread on that. Um, so <clears throat> kind of kind of that ballpark and it varies. I think right now it's in the fives. Last quote we got was in the fives. Um, so does that make sense, Mario? Yes, 10 year treasury. Correct. Awesome, man. Awesome. Um, Yes, go to the debt Zoom. So the debt Zoom happens on uh, every other Wednesday. This tomorrow, we're going to have the advanced underwriting with Victor N to the G. And then the following Wednesday, we're going to have uh, the debt Zoom again with Jerry and Shelly Miles. And I believe this time around, their son JJ is actually going to talk about uh, the current state of the market. Uh, can't miss, can't miss that one. So, uh, yes, please go to that one. It, it really is helpful. We got one more question here. I want to touch base on real quick. Uh, Wes is asking, uh, is there some kind of map online that shows what a normal cap rate in the area? It's, I, I don't think there is a rule of thumb for any specific area. It is really based on a city. I would say um, you guys might even be able to show me how it even smaller than that. Like cap rate is so subjective as well, where you can ask 10 realtors and you get four answers. Now, will the answers be close? I really hope so, but I wouldn't bank on it. And also on the other thing you have to realize what the cap rate is, a lot of it is factored into what the current debt market is like, ironically enough. Um, so it cap rate is such an evolving thing. That's why I don't like relying on one specific cap rate. Like this is my target. I have to be at this because there's so many components to it. Why is it that? Like, is it a vacancy issue? Is it an, is that then, then, and at the end of the day, it's just a number based on the performance. If there's a lot of vacancies, I could go and rehab it and double the rent. I, that cap rate's going to have a lifespan of like three months. Who cares? And I'm saying, I'm not saying go buy things at 1%. That's not what I'm implying. But just keep in mind that the cap rate shouldn't be a deciding factor on whether you buy a deal or not, in my opinion. Again, I, I have my crazy ideas and not everyone agrees, but that's why you should get do your research, learn from a bunch of different people and draw up your own conclusion is how I like to um, respond to questions like this. But don't get married to a cap rate, in my opinion. I agree. <clears throat> Mario has some really good questions. I think we need to bring Mario up and uh, take him off mute <laughs> come on vegas let's go brother let's what's do, up man how you doing let's do it william i'm doing really good, good so i'm man. just curious just on on the debt overview section of it, it seems to be where i'm i'm hovering uh yep. just because you hear different schools of thought but are you of the opinion that you should underwrite based upon maximum leverage is, is that your guide? I know, of course, you've got to factor in the DSCR and make sure it's above what the lender's minimum looks like. So do you typically use that as your guide? Or when you're looking at this, what 
would you say determines a deal for you? Is it just the upside? Is it any function of what the debt overview section looks like? Is it a combination of, of other issues as well? How would I look at this once I plug in my numbers and say, I've got a deal I can keep underwriting or, or based upon how you guys use this every day? That's a really, really, really good question, Mario. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. I'm going to take a crack at it here if you guys don't mind. And then maybe you guys can add to it. Um, so when I'm looking only at these deals, or the napkin underwriting to determine whether this could be um, a good deal to dive into uh, are two things, at least. So the going in cap rate, and I'm going to look at my upside. Okay, okay. those two things are going to drive my returns. So <clears throat> the cap rate, the cap, the going in cap rate is going to drive my cash on cash stuff, right? And then my my upside is going to determine my IRR and my uh, you know multiplier, equity multiplier, right? Mm -hmm. It's that lump sum kind of you know also time value sort of uh, calculation that's going to go into the IRR and uh, et cetera. So <clears throat> with that said. Your your going in cap rate is uh, it's is a good litmus test uh, to depending on what kind of debt you have, right? So let's say that you have uh, your interest rate is coming in at you know six percent or six and a half percent, whatever, right? The, regardless of how levered it is, um, <clears throat> if you're negatively leveraged on your going in cap rate, that's obviously a bad idea, right? Right. So. Uh, that's going to help me determine that because that's, I mean, that's really going to affect my returns, right? And it's going to affect my DSCR too. So it's all going to be related. Mm -hmm. and my DSCR is going to be a driver of, uh, of, of my cash flow as well, right? Because how much of mm -hmm. my NOI am I going to have to take out to pay the bank and keep to then give to my investors, right? Mm -hmm. Also to remember that the, the less, the more leveraged you are, the higher your returns are and vice versa. But then again, the more risky the um, that is. So, yeah, it is a combination of different things. But to me, the going in cap rate tells me a story of several different things uh, when comparing, you know, that and the and the interest rate. And the upside also gives me a good idea of whether this is something that I want to look further into, and if and if it has legs. Um, one last one last follow up question. I appreciate all your help, Otto. Yep. So is there a certain uh, spread between or delta between the interest rate and the going in cap that you look at on just at first glance and tells you, okay, this is something I should spend more time with? Yeah, man, we try to stay to about a hundred points. So a one percentage okay. point, you know, between one and the other. Uh, we're not super married to that because a lot of that, um, depending on how much, you know, work it needs and, you know, what the mm -hmm. leverage looks like, it might be more or less. Um, but I, you know, we try to stick to around a point. If it's about a point, uh, sorry, a, a percentage point, uh, then we're like, yeah, let's, let's plug it into the pro forma. Okay. That's a good rule of thumb. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. 50, 50 to a hundred. Go ahead, Ed. My bad. Mar no, you're good. Mario, thank you for the question. I, I like this a lot. Um, I want to just add my two cents before we wrap it up here is it really is important to know your investors. Because you may like it, and then you turn around to all the people that have the money to invest in the deal, and they're like, no, I don't like it. I, I don't look at it like that. And you're just sitting mm -hmm. there like, I would buy this all day, but the people who are putting up the money want a higher cash on cash, want a higher depreciation asset, want something in a better class neighborhood. They don't care about the um, value add component. They just want something safer, or they want something mm -hmm. riskier. You know, it's really, and again, I, I say this a lot because it's one of the biggest factors driving forces and for anyone starting out, in my opinion, in, in this business and in order to be successful in purchasing multifamily is you have to know what you're looking for. And if not, you're, you're just running in the dark and mm -hmm. you're going to hit it, run into stuff and it's not going to be fun. So it's really important that you know what you like and, and, and make sure more, it's hard to say more importantly, what are your investors like? And can you mm -hmm. follow through on that? If they want a high cash on cash return, cool. How can I get there? If they want a high um, upside play where they don't care about the cash on cash in the five years, but they know in the five years you're doubling or tripling the equity, then that's the play. 
it, it really depends on your investors. I have people that don't care about anything but cash on cash. And I have buyers mm-hmm. that care only about IRR. And I have buyers mm-hmm. that don't care about any of that. They just want to steal. Got it. So it's really important to That's know. That's good who- advice. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, of course. Thank you for your participation. It's greatly appreciated. And yes, on sir. that note, we have hit, well, six o'clock my time, nine o'clock for the East Coast and uh, in between for the rest of you guys. So thank you so much for coming by again. Absolutely love the participation. You guys make this so much more fun and so much more interactive and I think more educational. Um, I also commend everyone for uh, that ask the question because you don't realize how many other people have the same question until you ask it. So you definitely um, thank you guys all for the participation. Make sure to email me. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but I did try to send out the calculator in the chat. If you didn't um, get it or if you lose it, whatever it is, you have my email. Reach out to me and I'll forward it to you. Uh, I got nothing else. All the will, anything else to close us out? No, man, I hope you all have a good week. Thanks for coming out tonight, guys. Good participation, Mario. Thanks, everyone. It was fun. Go take some action.